Welcome to Great Beaks Podcast, Season 5, Episode 225. In this fine episode, we explore the case for Avi Loeb, Brown Mountain Lights update, listener comments, and what's next. Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome to the Creep Geeks podcast. If it's your very first time tuning into the podcast, we're glad to have you here. And if you uh, hang around and check with us periodically, we appreciate it. Yeah. We appreciate all the all the people's listening. <laughs> yes. Okay, so in this particular episode, we have a couple of different things we're going to talk about. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is what you can do to help listen and support our podcast. Okay. You know, it, every time I say that, it reminds me of, of like, it might be this time of year. I'm not sure. It might be completely coincidental where like public television show or broadcast, we call it a PBS. Yeah. You're like, once again, we need your financial <laughs> support, right? And it's not it at all. What we're looking at is if you'd like to listen to the podcast, we would like you to listen to the podcast and possibly do a review. If you don't want to listen to the podcast, that's fine. What are you doing here? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways you can interact with the podcast. Omi has a phone number for you. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yes, and with that phone number, you can call and leave a message. Yes. Um, if you'd like, and maybe share a story or something that you'd like to uh, let everybody know about. You know, maybe you got something interesting that happened to you, something weird, something crazy. Or not, you can just say hello. Uh, because when people make contributions like that, we actually talk about them on the podcast. And in this particular episode, we have a listener comment where somebody has gone and not used the phone number, but they went to our website creepgeeks.com and filled out the contact form yeah and so when we check it we actually put it in the podcast and that's what we're doing with this so we also have a facebook group that you can come check out and interact with us and look at our funny memes and stories and stuff you can also share ideas for the show as well as suggestions or if you want a clarification on anything we've talked about in the podcast and you don't see it in the podcast notes that are included in every episode yeah so there's that. Anyway, moving back into the podcast, here's the deal. Uh, we are a paranormal and weird news podcast, and we basically share things that we find to be interesting. Right? Yes. Yes. And sometimes people do too. They're like, hey, yeah, that's interesting. That's great. Sometimes they don't. It's all right. The point is, is that when it comes to paranormal and weird news, it's really all subjective, right? Mm-hmm. And some of the stuff that we talk about, we think is interesting at the time and it doesn't become interesting until way later. (laughs) And then all of a sudden everybody else is talking about it. Okay. Yeah. So this is one of those times where we're kind of putting something out there in a way that we think is going to be pretty interesting and is sort of a telling sort of a tidbit, if you will, about the state of paranormal and weird encrypted and just 14, what do you call it? 14. 14 or 40 on or whatever you want to say. Because this is something that we think is going to be one of those things that has sort of shifted the tide when it comes to like paranormal, cryptid, 14, UFO, all that sort of thing. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's what we're going to talk about in our podcast coming up. And it's just something that you, you know, should pay just a little bit of attention to. But before we roll into that, we do have a 14 term of the day. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And that 14 term of the day is probably one you've heard before. Yeah. But... Since we have a fan who submitted it, we're yeah. going to bring it up again. And it also is relatively, uh, it's relevant, sort of. So there you go. I uh, thought you were going to do it. You going to do it? No, you do it. Okay, so the 14 term of the day is Men in Black. Yes. Now with Men in Black, we've talked about this in a couple, multiple episodes throughout the years. But what it boils down to is the idea that a strange person dressed in black would show up Typically after you've seen something or maybe witnessed something or saw something strange or were part of something strange or what they would call high strangeness, right? And either ask you questions about it, but basically what it is, it's just like you see in the movies, right? Man in Black shows up, asks you some questions. They're always weird. They have sort of strange sort of characteristics or things about them that make them a little off. Mm-hmm. 
and you know it might be you know the the facial structure the height the way they're dressed all that sort of thing but what it is is just basically something that's just not right with these people if you want to call them that and they typically show up after you've seen or witnessed something that you probably should or shouldn't have should as in if you've gone looking for it and you've sort of come across something because that's your thing or shouldn't have it's just wrong place wrong time and they conduct a rather strange interview or almost interrogation of you with your experience some people report after the interview possible surveillance after the fact just to make sure that nothing further happens or you don't act out yes um and then and see this this is the problem with the subject of men in black it gets pretty varied because there's different types of men in black that come could show up yeah you've got some men in black that just appear to be you know strange it's kind of off you know but they appear to be more human than not and possibly military and origin type thing right then you have other men in black that can show up that just don't they're just not right and they could be extraterrestrial in nature or at least that's the idea or hybrid in nature or robotic or robotic in other words otherworldly if you will um but really the idea of men in black kind of started with um ingrid cold and the whole Mothman thing when that started in the 60s. And John Keel wrote about it and that kind of thing. So we're not going to do too much in that because Men in Black is a, a podcast episode into itself. It could be many podcast episodes. And in the future, we may be doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just kind of move into what we're going to talk about because this particular podcast is not going to be as long as our other podcast because we're making some changes here to Creep Peaks podcast. And it's going to start with this particular episode. Okay. We're not going for an hour. Or an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, we've been giving it some thought. We need to shake things up a little bit, maybe make some changes for the better, and that's what we're going to do. So this podcast episode is not going to be an hour and 25 minutes long. It's going to be shorter. Yeah, how much shorter? will let you know when we're done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So recently come across this article about Avi Loeb, right? Yeah. And yeah. if you don't know who Avi Loeb is, and I think a lot of people who have glossed over this are not really paying attention to it. Avi Loeb is the beginning of something that's going to change UFOs and UAPs, extraterrestrials, all of that sort of thing, just by the fact that Avi Loeb is going to do what Avi Loeb has been sort of uh, contracted to do. And let me explain. What he is, is he's a top Harvard astronomer, and he's studying UFOs thanks in part to the Pentagon report. So the Pentagon report came out, and it talked about UAPs, right? Unidentified aerial phenomenon. And the Pentagon report was not very detailed, and it wasn't very long. And basically what it boiled down to is there are things out there that we don't know what they are. Is really all it said. Mm -hmm. They didn't deny, but they didn't confirm, right? Yeah. And what they did say was, is that there's things out there that we don't understand. We don't know what they are. Could be military, could be something else. We're not exactly sure. But we're going to look into it. And so, with every, and this is sort of a really condensed sort of thing as far as like all these articles and stuff that came out of New York Times and, you know, all of that stuff that's been occurring, which really has been much ado about nothing as far as disclosure. Yeah. They're saying what everybody already knows. Yeah, there's stuff out there that we can't explain. And and with him, the name is so familiar because, and, and part of this article goes all the way back to 2017, in which I think is the first time we talked about him, because you brought up his theories and his considerations about what Umamu was. You know? Right. So we've been talking about this guy for a while, and now it's like, finally, everybody else is like, Oh. <laughs> kind of, but see, here's yeah. where it gets... Okay. I'm going to do a quick segue here, right? Yeah. What's the difference between a professional photographer and a professional photographer? <laughs> a professional photographer, right? Depending on who you talk to, if the person has this spiffy camera, if they say that they're a professional photographer and they're taking pictures, right? That's a professional photographer. Mm-hmm. Okay. In my world, a professional photographer is someone who's recognized by their peers as being a professional and getting paid for it. Okay. Because honestly, the camera matters, but it really doesn't matter. Yeah. 
it's the skill, right? It's the thing behind it. But what legitimate, what makes that person a legitimate professional photographer could be a couple different things. If that's their vocation and they're getting paid for it, right? Mm -hmm. They're probably a professional photographer. And companies like Canon had, you know, a, a criteria to determine if you were a professional or not. And it wasn't just the gear. It was like, okay, if you would like to join our little club that we have, called Canon Professional Services, so much money of your income needs to be needs to be derived from professional photography. Wow. And I think at the time it was like 70%. This is a long time ago, right? Yeah. But even so. So what sets Avi Loeb apart? Okay, not only is he a professor of science at Harvard, right? Mm-hmm. Now he's getting paid to legitimately study UFOs. Okay, so what we actually have here is in a rare instance, when it comes to the UFO, right, search, idea, whatever you want to call it, right, you, just to say ufology in general, mm-hmm. you have somebody who is a legit scientist, recognized as being a legit scientist, getting paid to research UFOs. Now, there are other people out there that do this in their time, right, yes. and they're legit scientists. But this guy is in the news. What? I know you disagree. No, I've been trying to interject. And you should hold your little hand up. Like, uh, <laughs> and then, you know. So that everybody else sees my invisible hand up. Well, no, it lets no. me know that you're going to jump in there. Because, okay, but what you're saying as a whole, though, is there's something just outside of what you're saying. And that is the fact that this guy... Um, the whole professional argument, he's bringing his professional background and recognition almost as an outside source. I mean, he, the other people in the ufology world, uh, they worked from the bottom up in the paranormal UFO community. This guy is already considered a scientist, a researcher, an expert in other fields, and now he's coming over to the UFO field. Or being recognized in the UFO field. And I think that speaks to a larger issue in the community. This guy is using his third-party recognition. Well, he's not using it. I'm not saying anything bad about him. But the media and the rest of us are recognizing, recognizing him as an expert because he's an expert in something else. No, not necessarily an expert. Well, He's being recognized as a legitimate scientist to study yes so far ufos but would he get the same recognition if he started as a legitimate scientist in the ufo community as opposed to well here's the thing yeah and i'm not trying to make anybody mad there is not one legitimate (laughs) ufo scientist Because okay, but do you understand what no, I'm trying no, to I say? No, I do. You're, yeah. I, I, at this yeah. point, I, I'm not. I'm, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. This guy is a Harvard astronomer mm-hmm. who is now being paid to research, right? Mm-hmm. UFOs. Yes. Okay, so there is no certification to become a ufologist. Yeah. I mean, you can pay three hundred bucks and take a test, and you're mm-hmm. congratulations, you are a paranormal investigator. Mm-hmm. Or you're a cryptological, cryptozoological investigator guy or whatever, right? And none of them are really recognized. And I think there was one that offers like a class, or like in a legitimate college where you can get a certificate. But there is no degree in ufology. Yeah. I mean, you can go be a, a, a lawyer, a dentist, whatever you want, and go to school for it, right? Mm-hmm. Like say a doctor. A doctor goes to school, goes to like multiple schools to become certified, recognized, and, and well-trained. And that doctor is a doctor. You can't say, well, when I graduate high school, I'm going to take some community college classes in ufology, and then I'm going to transfer it over to, you know, University of North Carolina, Asheville, right? <laughs> and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to be a certified professional ufologist. That does not exist. I know. So what you actually have is you have people that have other backgrounds and other walks of life and other professions, and then they lend their knowledge, skills, and abilities to the study of ufology, whether they're working for Move On or just doing their own research, or really active in the community and being able to speak at conferences and things like that. And you have other people that are rock stars in this field, 
uh, through television shows like Ancient Aliens and that kind of thing. And I'm just using the real popular stuff out there. So, that, you know, if you're listening to the podcast and you're not really heavy into this stuff, you wouldn't know half the people I bring up anyway, right? Yeah. But, but this guy is bringing legitimacy to the idea of studying UFOs. And, and see, that's where my, my torn heart resides because it's like we have to bring this external legitimate scientist astronomer person in to bring legitimate legitimacy to the topic, the subject of UFOs. Yeah, finally, and about time. Whereas, and it and it's messed up because, okay, like say somebody wants to read an article about ancient aliens or a recent news segment about one of the alien or UFO shows that have these actual experts on it who've been in the community and done research for years or decades. When you read that news article, half the time there's tongue-in-cheek jokes or there's kind of like a slight to them. Yes. And like I have an article in front of me right here for Avi Loeb and not a single sarcastic comment, nothing slight, nothing rude to an extent. It, it's just a very matter of fact. So it's like even the fact that this guy didn't come up in the UFO community gives him a different, um, well, gives these articles a different voice, I should say. Yeah, that's my entire point. Yes, good. It's just... It, I, it, wrong or not. I, I mean, okay, so let, you could be the, you can be a a, a master plumber mm-hmm. and been a master plumber for 30 years and research, research UFO stuff. And at the end of the day, they're still going to say, you know, UFO researcher and master plumber... Okay. You see what I'm saying? So uh, the point I'm trying to make is is that this guy has been picked to research UFOs, and he is a top Harvard astronomer. He studies space. Okay, so that's his background. There is no like, oh, did you take, you know, Little Gray Aliens 101 at school? <laughs> There's none of that. None of that stuff actually exists. Yeah. So, yes, he automatically has some sort of legitimacy based off of his title and the positions he's earned and, and basically his, his um, curriculum, basically his, what do you call that, his pedigree or whatever, yeah. I don't know, because I'm obviously not a Harvard astronomer by any means. But that's my point. This guy has legitimacy, and now he's researching UFO stuff. Mm-hmm. That's bringing and automatically stepping up the idea that UFO stuff should be paid attention to. It's hard to scoff and laugh at this dude from Harvard who's researching UFOs. Because when you talk about Bigfoot stuff, if you said, hey, who's the most credible, legitimate Bigfoot researcher out there? Yeah. You know, there's a million of them, right, that we could list. But at the end of the day, if you got somebody like Lauren Coleman who actually studies the physiology, right? of footprints and feet and all of that sort of thing. And he is a scientist and he is a scientist in that field. If you hand him a big footprint and he can look at that and he applies his knowledge to it. I mean, to him, he has a, a certain layer and air of legitimacy, right? Well, like, okay. And you know, like Dr. Jeff Meldrum, cause he's, you know, professor of anatomy and anthropology, but he also studies. Yeah, did I say Lauren Coleman? Yeah. I meant, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually meant. Yeah. And Lauren Coleman, he's someone who's been in the industry and has researched right. and researched I'm a, and researched. I'm a Jeff Melvin, you know, man. but it's like honestly, they both kind of look the same. <laughs> Don't I'm say sorry, that. they do. You know, hey man, I but, don't have my glasses on. You know, I mean, and I think I should be glad because, with at least in the ufology community, this is a scientist that's being brought in to bring legitimacy and focus and attention to the subject matter. Whereas, honestly, I think. And this goes back to a conversation we had outside of the podcast. Uh, the paranormal community, it felt like they were just, there was a moment, especially in TV and in internet culture, where it was like celebrities were being brought in or people who could conduct themselves in a certain manner rather than people who might have some sort of like spiritual background or um, other background that would add legitimacy to like the paranormal like haunted and ghost community. Yeah. It's almost like comparing, (laughs) I'm going to use a, a a popular famous newspaper that used to be, um, 
full of integrity, which is no longer. But anyway, it's like comparing something like the New York Times to the National Enquirer. Right? Somebody would come out and say something, and you'd look at them, and they would be like a National Enquirer. People say, oh, they scoff, like you said. You know, make fun of them. Yeah. Tongue-in-cheek. Discredit what they do. All of that sort of thing. Right? Yeah. So then you, anything that you would read about this person or whatever it is they were doing, if you're not in the know and somebody who is is more than just watching it on TV, uh, you would think, oh, you know, ha ha, whatever, and it's it's not real or whatever. You know, you just you read it like, oh, it's just fa- some sensational, fantastical thing, right? Mm-hmm. Can't do that with this guy. Yeah. Now, there's a couple different reasons why I think this is important. Number one is the government ha- has said, hey, we're going to look into this a little bit more seriously. Mm-hmm. Right, because the reports were pretty weak and all, and they had to admit that there was something to this, you know. And the idea of the government actually looking into it, and the idea of somebody who has a legitimate background, and I don't mean legitimate in the UFO community, I just mean legitimate. This guy's an astronomer from Harvard, is going to start to change the way some of this stuff is actually seen, and this is going to have a triple trickle down effect, right? And the idea um, that you have serious professionals that are credible, and I don't mean serious as in the people that are researching this are not serious because they absolutely are. We've met them. They only want to crack a joke. If you joke around about Bigfoot or Sasquatch or UFOs, they they just don't – no. It's not funny to them because they take it very seriously. I mean serious as in this guy's serious business. You know, he he didn't start out researching UFOs, but now he is, but he draws on background where he has that sort of academic pedigree – it sort of puts him in a, in a different place. You know, and it's almost like I was going to make a joke about, you know, you have a doctor of medicine and then you have a chiropractor who also has a doctorate, but it's more, it's a paper doctor and not like a doctor doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I because that's not necessarily recognized as being, and now over time, chiropractic, you know, there has become a lot more, it's been taken a lot more seriously in hospitals and things like that. It was before people just call them like bone crackers or your, you know, your quack or whatever. But, yeah. um, but yeah, when you know Washington out there and the government released this report on UFOs, and Avi Loeb got a call from the Harvard Astronomy Department that set off an usual series of events, and this came from NBCNews.com, and basically, here's what he says: I've been in academia for 40 years and been a department chair, so the guy's been in doing his thing for 40 years, right? And never have I seen a situation where a faculty member gets funding without looking for it or even meeting with the donor. Here's what happened to him. A billionaire met him and gave him money and said, you're going to research UFOs. Oh. So he was approached. He didn't seek this out. And that even makes it even more legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. But see, now he has his own theories on life in the universe and, and extraterrestrial life and that sort of thing. But he didn't seek this out. He didn't say, guess what I am today? He didn't wake up and say, I am a UFO investigator. He was approached, right? And he got a, a, a relatively modest you know, source of money here, fund, of $1.755 million that comes from private sources. And he was approached by a billionaire, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like he's not, you know, taking that grant money that would otherwise go to like research dark matter and things like that. It's just that, you know, basically he's researching UFOs and alien life. I hope that the research is pertinent or specific to what his expertise is. So if it's going to be like sky observation and like anecdotal video evidence, that would be great. Where do aliens come from? They come from space. He studies space. Well, I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, even if you look at somebody like um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Mm -hmm. if he just came out of nowhere and started saying UFOs are real, let me tell you why, I'm going to do some research on it. Do you think that would help him or hurt him in his career? It would probably help him. It would probably get him some new fans. Yeah. But in the scientific community, they'd probably start to put him in the same category as Bill Nye the Science Guy. (laughs) You know and they're he's pals, not. right? <laughs> I know they're pals, but at the end of the day, if if there was okay, so if you've got, let's just say three scientists, and you have to pick two to play on your team, you got Michio Kaku, 
Done. Right, Neil deGrasse Tyson <laughs> and Bill Nye the Science Guy. Who are you picking? I'm not picking Bill. No. No. Unless it's something, you know, maybe, I don't know. Because, yeah, you're, you're going to pick Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're going to pitch pick Michio Kaku. And then if you said, okay, I've got Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein, Michio Kaku, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, I need you to pick two scientists. Who are you picking? Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. Because, see, now they're in the same category as Bill Nye. Hmm. You see where I'm going with all this? So, anyway, the idea that Ivy Loeb is basically the beginning of what could be credibility and legitimacy in the UFO community, because when you've got somebody who's sitting at Harvard who's basically like, hey, man, I got money from an undisclosed private source, a billionaire, to research UFOs. That's You can't make fun of that. I mean, you can try, and there's been a couple of articles that have tried to blast him a little bit about his ideas of extraterrestrial life and how life created, but they can't even do that. Yeah. Because the guy was more legit, right, than the news article that published it. It's like, oh, I looked at the news article. I'm like, this guy's trying to slam this guy a little bit here in his crappy website article. He didn't even, and then that was the entire, that's what hit me. He's like, that's the entire point. Government's taking it serious. There's been a little bit of money put towards the, from serious people about this serious person with legit pedigree, right, to research UFOs. Yeah. I mean, come on. Now, I think this is the beginning of something that's going to start changing things. Because hopefully with this guy, right, and, you know, he, he's even been known to irritate uh, the mainstream astronomy community, but he's opening the door because this guy's at Harvard, right? He's, he's, he's got his pedigree set up there. He's been there for 40 years. So if he starts to talk about it, starts doing research, what do you think all these other scientists that are worried about their funding are going to do? They may be more likely to open up and talk about it too. Hmm. And if they're more willing to open up and talk about it and to discuss things from their perspective based off their field of study and how it would relate to UFOs and, and aliens and extraterrestrials and life from elsewhere, it's only going to further the cause. That is going to give some grant writers some horrible headaches. <laughs> Just <laughs> not, not if those grants pertain to searching for UFOs and extraterrestrials. Yeah. Because you couldn't walk up to somebody. That's why this billionaire met this dude like on his porch. Yeah. So here's money to research this. Because if he tried to go through legitimate channels for grants and everything, the people that want to control the purse strings, even if it's your money to give to him, probably wouldn't be able to do it. Well, you don't meet the criteria. This dude's like, I'm a billionaire. I got money. Here you go. You're going to research UFOs. And you know what he said? Okie dokie. <laughs> hmm. So by circumventing this entire thing and putting it, the money towards this guy who's been in the news and has these radical ideas about astronomy and life from elsewhere, he's opening the door for other people who may want to do research more out in the public and with more of a credible eye to it, to be able to do that without being worried too much about losing their grant funding or their credibility or their legitimacy as a research scientist. Hmm. And this has been a long time coming, because if you told anybody 15 years ago, I'm a UFO guy, they're like, you're a freaking nut. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're a nut job. You know, that's what you are. Ha ha. Uh, you, you like ghosts? Whatever, man. You're a nut. You know, on, because like, nobody believes in that kind of thing, right? Randy Quaid, Independence Day, lone gunman. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, I know. Oh, you're like an X-Files person? No, yeah, you're a whack job. And that has sort of shifted because of the popularity of television shows. Except, and that's that's the big caveat I had with my original argument, the whole um, television shows and public opinion and public perception, because... While we were talking about the legitimacy of Avi Loeb and how he's got this accreditation in this background and he has this professional acumen acumen that he's built up and built up, I'm thinking about some other people in popular media right now who have a scientific background, like, oh, an aerospace engineer that's out someplace in Utah right now. But that legitimacy is just not there with that particular scientist. You're talking about the... Howard Hughes type billionaire who's known as being kind of out there, Bigelow? No, I'm talking about some people recently hired to investigate a ranch. Hmm. Yeah, but this is, I mean, yeah, but see, here's the thing though. Without the show and the popularity that's sort of occurred, he wouldn't be able, he probably wouldn't have been able to do that in a way where he's not a threat to his own business. Mm. 
he probably runs his own board. He's probably this this. I mean, I think if you're going to be a billionaire and you're going to do this kind of thing, you got to be bulletproof. No, I'm talking about the scientists surrounding that project. So, well, what scientists are those? Put them out there. What are they going to do? <laughs> Turn off our free podcast? <laughs> yeah, I got ten bucks. I can buy another domain, and we made this one. We can make <laughs> another one. Anyway, I mean, that, that's my entire point, though. Yeah, you know, but I would say if you were a billionaire and you do your own thing, if you're worried about your company, you know. You're probably going to be less likely to want to do something like that unless you are, you know, the majority shareholder of your own company. Or you're already known as being like a wild man. Like, you know, if, okay, so if Elon Musk said UFOs are real, aliens are out there, and I'm putting money towards it, and I don't give a shit what you think, Mm -hmm. people are going to be like, oh, that's just Elon. Yeah. Either A, he's talking out his ass, right? Or B, hey, there's something to it because maybe he already knows something. Because on the conspiracy side of things, right? Avi Loeb obviously already knows something, <laughs> right? And the people that gave him money, that's deep secret government stuff that are trying, le- trying to finally leak the truth yeah. without the culpability no. of having hid that secret since 1946. <laughs> and the ancient alien guys were all right. It's all correct. Maybe that's who I should be angry at, the History Channel. Well, hey, if it, I mean, the history, okay, so you can't be hangry at History Channel because, you know what, the History Channel, not that uh, original, in search of, True. made this shit real. But, I mean, they've brought so much visibility to the topic. Not like in search of. It, I mean, you had Spock telling you about talking, flying Aztec spaceships. I'm talking Nielsen, Nielsen ratings, downloads, and total watch time, so... History Channel and all the shows that they've brought to fruition, things like Skinwalker Ranch, Ancient Aliens, um, all those shows. Doesn't compare. And let me tell you why. There's a thousand channels out there, mm-hmm. right? So you have plenty of choices. It does compare because the if risk, we're going to rank that show that you watched in now. search of. No, because you're going to let me finish on this one. And it's the fact that the History Channel has chosen to carry this torch in a way that they feel will, again, bring more viewers, bring more visibility to the subject. But the manner in which they carry this torch, the attitudes and the personalities that they put in front of us to watch and ingest, I don't think add to the legitimacy. They go right back to that old mentality that we just talked about, that whole uh, Randy Quaid Independence Day whack job person. You know, Um, I don't, Unless people like Avi Loeb are kept in in a more professional situation and that legit, legitimacy is kept throughout their project, I am afraid ufology is going to go downhill into like this this wash of just, yeah, we had scientists look at it and we don't take it seriously. Maybe. That's a possibility, but I don't think so. Because if he's doing it and other legitimate scientists are doing it eventually – you're going to wind up having two sides. It's the side that says global warming is real. Mm-hmm. And the other side, all these other scientists that say, guess what? The sun is getting bigger and hotter. And they're going to fight each other over it. Because one's getting their funding from where? People that you know, want the champion global warming. And the other side, they're not. Mm-hmm. So, And what I was trying to say about In Search Of, back in the olden days, you didn't have a thousand channels to choose from. You only had like six. So well, the so fact that they people. took that risk <laughs> to put that out there, you know, I mean, if anything, when it comes to these shows, they were relegated to the same category of like the Twilight Zone. You know, you had these weird, wacky shows, but at the end of the day, they weren't really legitimate. I mean, the idea was cool, but they weren't really legitimate. I think the idea of Ivy Loeb, a pedigreed scientist, getting paid to research, right? And to put his thoughts and ideas out there is going to open the door for other legitimate scientists who look at this fringe science idea and put their ideas out there as to something that's going to be just a benefit to the entire thing. You know, like like I said, if Neil deGrasse Tyson walked up and said, hey, man, UFOs are real, and let me tell you why, you'd probably believe that more than coming from, like, you know, I don't want to say master plumber because there's nothing wrong with that. But you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's only going to make it better. 
I think. So anyway, the idea is out there. The spark is there. Hopefully this will bring more legitimacy to the whole thing, bring some real search, research, real evidence maybe. Maybe we'll get some better ideas. Or this whole thing is a ruse, a diversionary tactic. So what do you think about that? Yep. I uh, <laughs> lost internet. Ah, you know what that means, right? What? They disagree. Okay. Yeah. Or do they? Who knows? Anyway, I think we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. You've been listening to the Creep Geeks podcast, so uh, stick around. Now, here's where i got to try to hit the button and hope I get the right one. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. Very nice. Okay, so moving back into the podcast, uh, in the very beginning of the podcast, uh, we told you that, you know, hey, we have a contact form and things like that for you to be able to reach out and talk to us if you'd like or something you'd like to share or whatever, right? And sometimes people do that. And we have a listener submission. What do you think about that? Yeah. This person actually took the time to type out some stuff. So we're going to talk about what they said. And this kind of is a little interesting to us because we've been doing on the side and let's like on this, on the sneaky, let me call it, I'm not hip, on the down low. <laughs> Uh, kind of really looking into the Brown Mountain Lights and trying to work in a way that we can do some some more research on it and stuff. And so um, we've recently come across stories and things like that we've heard from people who really don't want to share. We'll ask them, hey, can we record this audio? No. Okay. And then they tell you the story anyway. You know, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. And, you, and you know, you got to respect people when they want to do that, but. You know, there's a couple different things. And, like, we will tell you about one uh, of the conversations we had about somebody. And, of course, this becomes word of a mouth situation there. But we're not going to say who they are exactly. But it's something that we talked about. Um, and they told us. But the submission that we have came from a person named Bryson. Yep. And Bryson basically wanted us to talk about Men in Black and John Keel's Men in Black. That was reported at the time of Mothman, that kind of thing, right? as a 14 term of the day. And we have talked about it in the past, so we figured we'd do that because you know, Bryson was kind enough to type some stuff, right? Um, and he also put off a story to us that we thought we would kind of say uh, on the podcast. So you want me to do it? Yeah. All right. So here's how the story goes. My mother and father back in the early 70s were in Linville, and we're talking about the Linville Gorge area. Right? You're yeah. shaking your head like I'm doing something wrong. So, yeah. Okay. So they were in Linville, right? They stopped to look at a, uh, stopped at a lookout because if you don't know, Brown Mountain Lights area, there is a pull off where you can easily drive to it and pull off and look uh, and hopefully be able to see the Brown Mountain Lights, right? So they stopped at the lookout on the road and a few cars pulled in. And they said later on, you know, a car was driving by slowly and pulled in and there was a woman and she asked them if they wanted to go see the lights. So everyone got in the cars, uh, got in their cars, and they followed a the woman. Now, this is interesting, interesting to us because there are people that we talk to say, oh, yeah, you, you can see them here, but this is the best place to go see the Brown Mountain Lights. And they can never give us the directions we need to get there because nobody thinks to do GPS or anything like that. It just becomes like, yeah, you just follow these obscure directions, and you should be able to see them. So they got in the car, they followed this woman, they followed it. You know, She drove a short while away, turned down a dirt path, which we haven't been able to find. Uh, and they found a spot, and basically they were able to sit there and watch and look for the Brown Mountain Lights. And what's interesting is the woman said that this is where the Army studied the lights. And the lady left as soon as it got dark. And the lights were starting to rise up out of the drop-off. And, you know, Bryce says mom is scared, and his dad swears they look like the glow off of cigarettes. And they glowed more than they actually gave off light, and they were a few feet away. So... And with this particular story, I find it to be even more interesting because we've heard that before. 
And we've actually talked about this story before and a version of this story before about how the lights actually look. Some people see them a different way. When I seen them, they looked like the glow was coming from inside and not from the outside, like it was from within. And mine, the way I view them is like I'm looking at actual stars almost. Yeah. And so it's <clears throat> kind of goes to the point where we think um, – that there may be more than one type of light that you can possibly see in this particular area. But I also started to pick apart this account because the whole lead off to a trail thing, when we go to that one overlook that we go to, there are trails that go off. And the last time we went out, I did go down one of them before it got too dark. And it looks like it goes down, wraps around the mountain, kind of steep like i i wouldn't want to go there after rain and it might end up at one of the other pull-offs like pull-off points yeah well that's the thing it's hard to get to you know they drove off in their car but where did they actually pull off and there's so many places that you can probably do that in yeah that you would not be able to find in the spring or summertime unless you knew where they were because the, the vegetation around here grows like crazy. But in the wintertime, you could probably see it real easy. And considering this is talking about the early 70s and then the Blue Ridge Parkway had a little rehab done in like the 80s or yeah. 90s, actually late 80s, I think it was. I mean, it might actually be a stop now or it might be lost or forever. Or it's fenced off because we've been to a yeah. couple spots we've seen that look like you could easily access and get to a spot for probably getting a better vantage point but it's chained off. We just went to one this weekend. Exactly. Yeah. So So there's more to that story but the couple things I found to be pretty interesting is the idea of going to a different vantage point because they are out there and we hear that a lot every time we go up there, oh you need to go here. Yeah. Or you need to go there, but it's it becomes sort of obvious in some ways that, you know, it, if the, if you're local, you know right where it is. <laughs> if you're not local, you have no idea. And you know, Blue Ridge Parkway and Appalachian, you know, the whole thing out here and the Linville Gorge and all that stuff, it, it's not a place to be trifled with as far as getting out there and getting lost. But, yes, I agree it is not a place to get lost. But then when you research, and I'm sure this is not isolated to this region, But when you research or ask for location details and somebody gives you these details that involve like four right turns and then turning left at the old something shop that burned down 20 years ago. But how would you know that? Because you're obviously a stranger who just got here and then gives you like this involved history of where you're supposed to go. Like I'm researching Tom's Creek Falls here in North Carolina. And apparently there's a couple of by roads and other places that you can go to, but you wouldn't know that given these directions. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what bait shop you're talking about. I see a bunch of rundown stick shack. Things, yeah. And you know? part of the problem is, is that, Hey, there's no cell phone service there. So it's not like you're gonna be able to mark that area on your GPS phone, <laughs> you know, because I mean, and that's some of the stuff that we do when we go places like that and we actually have service, we market it. We take a picture and we use geo tagging that's built into your free device. And it's not free, but you know what I mean? Yeah. To actually mark that location. And like, I've heard from three different people that say the same thing where you want to go is, and there used to be this old post office, which used to be a bait shop, which used to be something else though. When the river got really high, knocked it off its foundation and set it crooked. So it sits kind of crooked across the road. You want to go there. And I don't know where that is. I don't either. And they don't either. But they know how to get there, but they can't tell you how to get there. I'm like, is it interstate blah, blah, blah? And they're like, uh, nope. And some of these people have been here for so long that the road itself has changed names. Oh, yeah, it used to be this. It used to be old 221. Now it's, the you know, it's like, okay, whatever. And it becomes a, a difficult thing. Because I'm not one just to go riding around in the mountains and not know where you're going. Cause I kind of have to have an idea because there's a lot of places that we've gone in the past, like in the desert and places around here where you got to make sure you got gas. Yep. Cause if you don't have phone signal and you don't have gas and you get stuck out there, I mean, chances are you're not going to, you know, die or anything, but it, it's an inconvenience and I, and I, I don't want to be too inconvenient. So one of the things that we recently heard while we were on a, a, an adventure at the Brown mountain lights area recently we'll say in the past two months was we had a conversation with a couple people very nice people right 
which also turned into a conversation with a guy going by in a pickup truck because that one guy knew the other guy and they (laughs) talked for like 30 (laughs) minutes and I'm trying to listen to be a fly on the wall a little bit. Yeah. But one of the most interesting parts of the entire thing that I took away from eavesdropping and talking to these people, we're not going to say who they are because I didn't want to be recorded, right? Was that a man was burnt on the side of his body after coming into contact with a brown mountain light. And if I remember vaguely how the story went, they were in one of these areas that you can only find from local word of mouth type situation or somebody knows or whatever family knows they go hunting there, that kind of thing. They were in an area where it was prone to be able to see the brown mountain lights. And they were in an area where the local people see them all the time. And it's not a big deal. Well, one of the guys evidently reached out and sort of touched or come in contact with one of these brown mountain lights and here's, and it burnt him. Here's the cool thing. This guy, this witness or this experiencer, um, I can give his first name. So his first name was Jack. Okay. He was affiliated with one of the first surveying groups assigned to survey the area and then investigate the brown mountain lights. So he was out there, and he was surveying the entire area where this allegedly happened, and he witnessed one, got so close he was able to touch it, purportedly died of cancer. Yeah, he got burnt, put him in the hospital for a while, and then later on he died of cancer. Not like right then, but it was like, yeah, you know, a couple of years later this guy died of cancer. So, yeah. and from the description, you know, to me it sounded an awful lot like he died of radiation exposure or basically contact with something that had a large gave him a large dose of radiation to the point where he got a radiological burn maybe. And then that's later on, you know, kind of turned into uh, some cancer and killed him. But this is the first time I've heard of somebody coming in contact with the Brown mountain light and actually dying from it. Not from like some weird, you know, supernatural cause yeah or some weird sort of movie that was supposed to be made about the brown mountain lights or even the x-files episode that was made about the brown mountain lights you know that kind of thing this was like a local person telling me of a retelling or recalling of a story that he had heard from his family and from you know people he knew that lived in that area who seen them all the time so is this a real thing i don't know yeah but it has a slight bit of credence to it when compared to like an episode of of, uh, X-Files or something you read on Amazon about a movie that somebody was trying to make that didn't work out or a book that somebody wrote where they made some stuff up. And these people we talked to were extremely genuine and they, they They just didn't want to be recorded. They're like, nope, but I'll talk to you about it. Talk to you about it for an hour. It was funny because I talked to one of them for a bit and they seem very, um, invested in the phenomenon as well because I got tips on where to go to get some of the better maps for the lower area of the Brown Mountain Range. Yeah. And I was like, man, I've been actually looking for this advice for a yeah. while. So, that, I mean, they had, they had some knowledge, and it was nice. Yeah. And so that's just something we uh, kind of put out there a little bit. Because the older story that we heard that was a user submission sort of tied into what we actually heard from just random people that we talked to while we were there and was corroborated by the random guy in a pickup truck. Yeah. Who knew the other guy? <laughs> they didn't They didn't actually know each other, but they knew people, and then they wound up figuring out that they knew each other. And they had the same stuff to say, and they're from the same general area, and they knew the same general people. And so whether that story was passed along in sort of a you know, local lore kind of thing, but it, they had the same details. And they live within the area, so that's yeah. important, so too. I like that better than reading some weird Amazon review about a story that was never made or a movie that was never made. Or, you know, I mean, it was more legit – um, I wish we could have recorded it and played it for you guys, but they just didn't, they weren't interested in being recorded telling this story, which is fine. A lot of people are like that. So, and we're not going to be shady and do the like, well, in this particular state, if I want to be recorded, as long as one person of a two party conversation knows they're being recorded, it's okay. We're not doing that. Yeah. But uh, they were a nice couple. We talked to them for about two and a half hours, and basically we, we talked and, and did our investigation so long that the van battery died. 
<laughs> and I went and jump started the van and got it all started. You guys were still talking. You didn't even know that I'm over there struggling by myself in the dark. Stop. I was getting really great tips on a place to investigate, actually. Well. Yeah. That's cool. And then something about um, a local witch. Well, we don't want to talk about that because we're going to talk about that later. That's something that we need to look into. And I've heard that story before, and I've heard it from other people. Yeah. So it. But this time, I got a name. Yeah. So. And that was the thing we didn't get last time. So yeah. that's something pretty cool. Anyway, I just thought we'd kind of pass that along to you guys. Yeah. Yep. That's about all I think we're going to talk about. Oh. Well, okay. We'll talk about these two things because, I'm, again, I'm not trying to make a podcast be two hours anymore. Mm-hmm. It needs to be shorter. It needs to be easier on us but anytime we can talk about nessie we're going to talk about nessie okay so do you know who nessie is Loch Ness monster that's right so evidently in 2021 there's been nine sightings that have been reported oh yes so didn't we talk last episode about the guy giving a bad Review. Yes, he was yeah. very unhappy. <laughs> then he just basically had to go out there with his family and, and went all the way to the lock and didn't see anything. So to him, he didn't see the reason for being there because he couldn't see the reason for being there. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much, uh, it kind of goes like this. This actually came from Coast to Coast AM, and it was by Tim Banal. It says, after largely going unseen for most of the summer, the legendary Loch Ness Monster may have been spotted for the second time in less than two weeks. Oh. Yeah. And so, this sighting was by a man called Mr. Vcock, or Vcock, looks like Peacock with a V, like Victor. Um, He was visiting a Scottish landmark, and evidently there's like a million castles in Scotland, so I don't know which one it is. It says he was standing north of the Urquhart Castle, Castle and scanning the water with a pair of binoculars. And much to his surprise, he suddenly saw, saw a strange mass emerge from the water. Okay. And apparently he was able to get a fairly good look at the anomaly, and he estimated that the anomaly rose two feet out of the water and was about 10 to 12 feet long. Hmm. And unfortunately, the witness did not capture any photos or videos from the sighting, although he did produce a sketch of the potential creature uh, when he reported the case to the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register. I'm going to who we've talked about in the past, and the one guy, that's his job, is kind of worried. He didn't have enough sightings and everything. And <laughs> this guy's job is to document these things. 2020 really did destroy I think his name people. was Gary. <laughs> I think we kind of made fun of Gary a little bit about that. Like, Gary, that's his whole job. And, he, you know. and so this is coming on the heels of another possible observation that occurred July 19th. And so Vacox, or Vcox, uh, was the second potential Nessie sighting within just a handful of few days in between from the first one that happened. So... Um, no one had reported seeing the famed creature since early June. Hmm. So, and when you talk about Loch Ness Monster or Nessie sightings, you know, you can have a month or two in between, and that's considered to be a recent sighting because there was a large spate of time where there was no sightings. So whether this is some kind of indication that the beloved cryptid has returned from some summer sojourn or merely the result of more people visiting uh, Loch Ness uh, is really the question. Yeah. If you get more people there, there's a higher likelihood of actually seeing stuff, right? Gary but, Campbell. It was Gary. <laughs> so, old Gary. Yeah. Say, so, hey, Gary, how's it going? Well, we made a, got a reporting of sighting last week. So was he just sitting in his office and just waits? Actually, there is a picture of him sitting here with his MacBook on a stump at the edge of Loch Ness. Well, we should put a link to Gary. In the show notes, because everything we talk about on the Creep Geeks podcast is available to peruse at your leisure. We have all the links there, and you can go to creepgeeks.com, which is our website, and where we post, you know, every new podcast we do, we have the show notes, and then the show notes for all articles and are, are linked to all the articles and things that we actually talk about. So. This note literally says Gary, y'all, and then it's got a link. That's <laughs> all it needs. It's on good old Gary. So, yeah. So, anyway, yeah, definitely want to talk about that, put that in there. And so we're getting ready to wrap up the podcast. But since we're going to talk about basically Loch Ness, Loch Ness Monsters, something in the water, there is a mystery creature that has been menacing the British beach. Yeah. And having been to England, the beaches aren't, like, nice. You know, when you compare, like, the Caribbean or something like that. So anyway, so at this particular beach, um, lifeguards 
had to order the swimmers to return to shore after an unidentified and rather sizable sea creature nearly capsized a fisherman's boat. Okay. And it says the weird incident reportedly occurred Wednesday afternoon in the community of Boscombe, which sits uh, along the shore of the English Channel. And it says what one assumes began as a pleasant day at the beach turned into a concerning situation when multiple people reported seeing a large creature lurking out in the water. There were some splashes in the water. Right. Yeah. According to this witness. And the lifeguard said they hadn't seen anything like that in 35 years. So the lifeguards subsequently ventured out into the water in an attempt to locate the creature, but they were unable to find anything that would explain the sightings. However, there appears to be little doubt that something big made its presence known as a fisherman who was out on the water said he had an up-close and personal encounter with the proverbial monster. But where's the description? It doesn't say yet. It says, I was pulling a lure back into shore and something grabbed it. She goes, I almost turned over in my kayak. And he's turning around to see what had just stolen his fishing rod. And the man said, all he could see was a big shadow disappearing into the deep. Mm. So reflecting on what might have occurred, uh, Tapper observed that it was something big and theorized that it could have been a shark. Although the seasoned fisherman has never seen such a creature in those waters before, uh, he came to that conclusion, conclusion because I don't know what else it could, could be. He didn't know what else had the power, ultimately, right? Yeah. And so he expressed relief that he didn't fall overboard as it rocked his boat. And he says, uh, if you saw how it took my rod and reel, I didn't stand a chance. Okay. And he says, God knows it would have happened. I looked like a seal in my wetsuit. So this guy had enough time to give it some thought, right? So fortunately, the fisherman remained in his kayak with a story to tell rather than in the water where the mystery creature may have been mistaken him for a uh, snack. Hmm. So I don't know. Both That's kind of crazy. I know. It's just both of these. There's no photographic incident or like nope. evidence. And if it was a uh, beach with lots of swimmers, you'd figure somebody would have caught something like and put it on TikTok or thrown it up on social media yeah well it's english beach and the article uses a picture from getty images which shows this bright beach with people and green water and i don't think that's anywhere close to uh where this actually occurred so i don't know anyway there you go that's yeah. about all we're going to talk about this particular podcast episode avi Loeb is basically going to i think change things a little bit and open up the door for more legitimate scientists to get on board the ufo encrypted research wagon and maybe keep their funding or maybe even possibly get some funding that's outside of what they currently do so they can legitimately research it yeah and uh, we talked a little bit about brown lights, uh, brown mountain lights, with the idea that somebody actually made contact with one and died. Because if that be the case, and they died from like some crazy radiological or energy type berm, then the idea that these lights may be uh, some kind of plasma hmm. gets even more and more relevant, I guess, as far as the idea behind that. Yeah. And there's some monsters in England, sea monster types, and Gary, <laughs> whose job it is to record a Loch Ness monster sightings. Sitting on a stump with his MacBook. Yep. So, anyway, that's about all we got. So, what do you think? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. I uh, do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Again, questions, comments, either give us a call, 575-208-4025, or creepgeeks.com and click the Contact Us link. Again, we are all over social media, so check us out on Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook. We have both a Facebook page where we post podcast episodes or a Facebook group where you can interact with us. Um, again, thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, check the links in our show notes. Sounds good. Yep. All right. Anyway, there you go. Any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. Uh, just be aware that here at the Creepy Geeks podcast, we are changing things up a little bit. So, uh, what that is exactly, we don't want to give it away, but it should be fun. Yeah. So anyway, tune in next time, and we're glad to have you here with us, and uh, see you later. Take it easy. Bicycle. Bye. Bye.